Hello and welcome to this GCSE Chemistry explanation video about electrolysis. This is the first of three videos about electrolysis and this one is going to focus on molten ionic compounds. In this video I'll take a look at what electrolysis actually is and how we carry it out working with ionic compounds and we'll finish by looking at how we can predict the products that will form as a result of the electrolysis process. Electrolysis is a process where electrical energy, or we could say an electric current, is used to make a chemical reaction happen. And the word itself breaks down into two parts. Lysis means splitting apart and electro means using electricity. And so together we are splitting things apart using electricity. We use electrolysis for a variety of different purposes and to give you a few we use electrolysis to separate an ionic compound into its component elements. We use it for metal extraction for particularly high reactivity metals. We can use it to produce useful chemicals, for instance hydrogen and chlorine are produced from the electrolysis of salt water. And we also use electrolysis for electroplating. You need to be able to understand and explain the process of electrolysis and you also need to be able to draw diagrams of the equipment that you use during the process. Typically in school you do electrolysis in a beaker but it could really be any shaped container or any scale of container. Into that beaker will go an electrolyte. The electrolyte is the liquid or solution that the electric current flows through. So it's essential that that electrolyte conducts electricity. Into that electrolyte we place some electrodes. These electrodes also need to be able to conduct electricity and it's really important that they are inert. That means that they are unreactive. Typically we'll use carbon in the form of graphite or a low reactivity metal, for instance, platinum. The electrodes are then connected to wires and they conduct electricity and complete the circuit. And the final component that we need is some kind of power supply, for instance, a cell or a battery that provides the electrical energy, which is the driving force behind the process. The electrolyte that's in the beaker needs to be an ionic compound. These are compounds made from positively and negatively charged ions. As a solid, the ions are in a fixed position in a giant three-dimensional lattice. And these ions can only vibrate about a fixed position. And so they can't move. And so they can't conduct electricity. As a liquid, or when dissolved in water, the ions from the lattice are no longer in a fixed position and so they are free to move around within the electrolyte. This enables them to conduct electricity when an external power supply is connected up. If the electrolyte is made up of an insoluble substance, that means this ionic compound would need to be molten in order for the ions to be able to move. However, if the electrolyte is something that is soluble, we could instead choose to dissolve this chemical in water instead of melting it, and this will use much less energy, and so typically this is preferred. To begin our explanation of electrolysis, we'll first take a look at what happens at the graphite electrodes. Graphite is made from carbon in a giant structure. And because carbon only has three covalent bonds in graphite, there is one delocalized electron per carbon atom. But since the graphite has the same number of positive particles and these negative delocalized electrons, it is neutral overall. But when you switch on this external power supply, an electric current will flow and the electrons that are delocalized will move out of one of the electrodes, the one on the left as I'm showing it, and then these delocalized electrons will move through the copper wires, through that to the other electrode, where the electrons will start to build up. This will make the electrode on the right hand side become negatively charged because more and more negative electrons will be building up there 
And so this electrode will no longer be neutral. And then the other electrode, which has lost these negative electrons, will become positively charged. And so now we have two oppositely charged electrodes dipped into our electrolyte. And the electrolyte is made up of an ionic compound with the positive and negative ions that are free to move. And so the positive ion from the ionic compound is now going to be attracted towards the negative electrode because opposite charges attract. And so the positive ion will move through the electrolyte to the negative electrode. And the negative ion is going to be attracted towards the positive electrode. And so we'll move towards that. And this means that there is an electric current flowing through the electrolyte because electric current is the flow of charged particles. And in the electrodes and in the wires, these charged particles that are flowing through the circuit are the delocalized electrons. But in the electrolyte, it is the ions. And that's the core idea of what happens during electrolysis. And next we'll look at some examples. You need to know about the electrolysis of molten substances, sometimes referred to as melts, and we're going to take a look at lead bromide. In my container, I have my electrolyte, which would be the molten lead bromide. In order to make this molten, we would, of course, have to apply a high temperature to break apart the electrostatic attractions within the ionic compound. We've got the electrodes that are dipped into the electrolyte, and we've got the wire and, importantly, the power supply. When you turn on the power supply, the electrons will move through the electrode and the wires, and we'll have our positive electrode and our negative electrode. And then electric current will pass through the electrolyte, which is the molten lead bromide. Now, lead bromide contains two types of ion. It contains lead, which is a two plus ion, all metals will form positive ions, and it also contains the bromide ion, and bromine is in group 7, so when it forms an ion, it becomes bromide, which is 1 minus as a charge. And the negative bromide ions will be attracted to the positive electrode, so it will move across to the positive electrode, and they become discharged. And in this context, discharged means to have the charge lost or removed. And so that means that in the electrolyte, the ion had charge. Once the substance has arrived at the electrode, the ion gets converted into a neutral element. And so it has lost charge. And so in this case, the bromide ion loses electrons and becomes a bromine molecule, Br2. And since this is taking place at a high temperature, high enough to melt the lead bromide, the bromine that forms will be a gas. And then the positive lead ions will be attracted towards the negative electrode and they will gain electrons and become discharged as well. Remember, that means they have lost their charge and they will become the element lead, which will then fall to the bottom of the container as a layer of molten lead. If we zoom in on the processes that are happening at the two electrodes, remember the bromide ions moved across to the positive electrode where they lost electrons. And so that always happens at the positive electrode. The negative ion loses electrons. And the process of losing electrons is called oxidation. And the electrode where oxidation occurs is always called the anode. And then if we move across to look at the negative electrode, the positive ion moved across to the negative electrode because it was attracted there and it became discharged. It lost its charge. It lost its charge by gaining electrons. And the process of gaining electrons is called reduction. And the electrode where reduction always occurs is referred to as the cathode. Overall, then, in this electrolysis, the negative ion is attracted to and moves towards the positive electrode, where it loses electrons to the positive electrode. 
And then those negative electrons move through the electrode into the wire and through and round to the other electrode. And at that electrode, what happens is the positive ion is attracted towards it and therefore moves towards it and gains electrons and is reduced. And so really what's happening is the negative ion is losing electrons that are moving through the circuit and then the positive ion is gaining them at the opposite electrode. And so reduction is happening at one electrode, the negative one. Oxidation is happening at the other electrode, the positive one. And so overall, what's happening is often referred to as redox reactions, two half reactions. Reduction is happening at one electrode, oxidation the other, and together that makes a redox reaction. The positive ion is reduced at the negative electrode because it gains electrons. And we can record that as a sentence, as I've done here, but we can also write it as a chemical equation. And these equations are referred to as half equations. And the reason that they're referred to as half equations is because they show half of the redox process. One type of half equation shows the gain of electrons, and that would be referred to as a reduction half equation. And then the other half equation for the reaction that's happening at the other electrode is referred to as the oxidation half equation. So at the negative electrode, when we're electrolyzing the lead bromide, the lead two plus ions are gaining electrons and turning into the element lead. And the half equation is a really good way of showing the discharge that has occurred because the lead begins as a two plus charge and it finishes as a neutral lead atom. And so that literal discharge, the loss of charge, is clear to see from the reduction half equation. What's also clear to see from the half equation is that electrons are being gained because they are shown on the left hand side of the half equation. And on this occasion, because lead is a two plus ion, it needs to gain two electrons rather than simply one in order to be reduced to neutral lead atoms. At the positive electrode, where the bromide ions are discharged, we can also write a half equation there. The bromide ions begin as a negative one ion and they end as a neutral element. The element bromine, because it's in group seven, is actually a diatomic molecule. And so we need to recognize that in our half equation. And so to balance the half equation, we need to first balance it in the traditional way by making sure we have the same number of atoms of each element on both sides of the arrow. And we only have one bromine on the left and two on the right. And so we need to put a two in front of the bromide ions. And so, in fact, two bromide ions are needed to make one bromine molecule. And the bromide ions are getting oxidized, which means they are losing electrons. They're negative at the beginning because they have the electrons, but afterwards the molecule is neutral because they've lost them. And so to represent that, we put two electrons on the right hand side of the oxidation half equation. Alternatively, we can show that oxidation half equation slightly differently by showing those two bromide ions and then we put the electrons on the left hand side but we put a minus sign in front of it and that represents the loss of the electrons. By putting the minus two electrons on the left hand side, we're showing that those electrons are being lost and then we still have the same Br2 on the right hand side. Mark schemes for exams will typically have this top half equation as the dominant one that they expect you to say, but they will say in the commentary on the right hand side to allow the second one. So you can use whichever one of those you prefer that makes the most sense to you. You need to be able to predict the products that will form as a result of carrying out electrolysis on any electrolyte that you are given. You might be given a formula or you might be given a name for this electrolyte, but all of the electrolytes will be what is called a binary ionic compound. 
And a binary ionic compound is one made up of just two elements. So one ion will be positive and be made up of one element, and the other element will be negative. Sometimes ionic compounds have got more than two elements in, but this will only be binary compounds. And so if we take a look at three examples, first of all, magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide has got the formula MgO. Mg is magnesium and the O is the oxygen. But on this occasion, the oxygen is a negative ion, so it will be the oxide ion. The two ions that are going to be present in the magnesium oxide are magnesium. Magnesium will be in group two, so it's got two outer shell electrons normally. And so when it becomes an ion with a full outer shell, it will be a two plus ion. Oxygen is in group six. It needs to gain two electrons to become stable. And so it will be a minus two oxide ion. Then we need to remember that the ions will move to their oppositely charged electrodes because that's the one they will be attracted to. And so the positive magnesium ion is attracted to the negative electrode where it gets discharged. And so we'll see magnesium forming at the negative electrode. That means that the oxide ion will be attracted to the positive electrode and so oxygen will form at the positive electrode. For a second example, let's take a look at zinc chloride with the formula ZnCl2. That formula means that there are two chloride ions for every one zinc ion. We know that chlorine is in group seven, so it will form one minus ions. To fill the outer shell, it must have gained one negative electron to get that eight electrons. Zinc, therefore, must be a two plus ion. We can't work that out from the position in the periodic table, but we can work that out because it is bonded with two negative chloride ions. Its positive charge must be cancelling that out. And then the positive zinc will go to the negative electrode and that's where it will lose its charge. It will be discharged. And the chloride ions will move to the positive electrode and will make the element chlorine. And then in a final example, copper iodide is made up of copper and iodide ions in the ratio of two iodide for every one copper. So the ions will be one minus for the iodide because again, it's a halogen from group seven and the copper must again be two plus to cancel out those two negative charges. The positive copper will then be discharged at the negative electrode that it was attracted towards and the iodide ions will move towards the positive electrode where iodine will form. It's really important to notice that the ions have got a different name ending to the element that forms at the positive electrode. So we had oxide, chloride, iodide, but we made oxygen, chlorine, and iodine. And that's because the ion has a different name ending to the element. It's also worth pointing out that we don't really need to know what the specific ions are in order to work out what the product will be. Because all we need to remember is that metal ions are going to be positively charged because they transfer their electrons to the non-metal. And so the positive metal ions will be attracted to the negative electrode where the elements will form magnesium, zinc or copper in these examples. And then the non-metal, which has gained the electrons, will be a negatively charged ion. And so that's why the non-metal always forms at the positive electrode. And you can see we've got the elements oxygen and chlorine and iodine. OK, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching.